Hello, welcome to the episode of the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vansky and I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today we have somebody who's been in the White House, who's been on the front lines of fighting for free markets and liberty from economic policy and many other ways. And it's none other than Paul Winfrey. Paul, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thanks so much for having me, Vance. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've been looking forward to this um, for a while now, Paul. And so it's great to have you on the program. Um, for the audience, though, let me go ahead and give your bio so that way they can know a little bit more about you. So Paul Winfrey is an economist and a trusted public policy advisor. He has served in top management and policy roles in the White House, the U.S. Senate, and, and in think tanks. He was a distinguished fellow in economic policy and public leadership at the Heritage Foundation. He is working to set up a new organization that will focus on economic policy that will launch very soon. Winfrey's research focuses on U.S. economic history, public finance, the political economy, the economics of media, and the economics of education. That's all over the place. He is the author of a book on the evolution of economic and fiscal policy from colonial America until the present called The History and Future of the Budget Process in the United States, Budget by Fire. Before rejoining uh, Heritage in 2018, Winfrey was a deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy, the deputy director of the Domestic Policy Council, and director of bu budget policy all at the White House. During the 2016 presidential transition, Winfrey led the team responsible for the Office of Management and Budget. Winfrey holds a master's in economics and economic history from the London School of Economics and Political Science and a BS in economics from George Mason University. And he soon will have his PhD in economics, if, if not already having it. I know he's coming out quick um, from Queen's University in Belfast. So with all that, Paul, first thing I like to ask every guest is to get a good idea of where they're coming from and help others to understand how people are thinking. What motivates you to do what you do each and every day? Well, thanks so much. I mean, whenever somebody reads your bio back to you, you have two thoughts. One, that's really embarrassing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and two, I'm a major nerd. Holy cow, <laughs> I didn't realize I was such a nerd. Um, I mean, honestly, I think that, well, first of all, that's a, that's a really great, great question. When when I think about what has motivated me to first get into policy and then what motivates me to get up every day and do ultimately what we do, ultimately it's changed over time, right? So when I was back in grad, when I was back doing my master's degree initially at LSC some 20 years ago, uh, and I decided to take a break from the PhD program and come to DC and see what this was all about. I wasn't expecting it to be a, a particularly long-term venture. I initially accepted a two-year fellowship at the Department of Justice. Uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to write my PhD on. I was, I've always been drawn to more practical questions, uh, research questions, and I just didn't have anything good to go with when I was at LSE at the time. And so I thought DC was a good place to explore some of those things. And then I got here and ultimately, well, I mean, I'm still here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I fell in love with the policy, with the policy making, uh, you know, community. And, you know, really, as you get integrated into it, um, you realize that DC and, and in particular, the DC policy community is really a, a really a small, small world. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I mean, I, I do my job, uh, for the same reason that I think a lot of people in America do their jobs. Uh, and that is that I, I love it. I love the, I love the subject matter. I love the people that I work with. Um, like yourself. And, uh, and, and yeah, I'm just fortunate enough to be able to do it. Yeah, that's awesome, Paul. Uh, I and mean, it comes out too. I mean, it's one thing about it is you're a happy warrior in this in this freedom fight as well. And uh, I love it. And, um, you know, when, when I'm thinking about your, your background, you know, saying the nerd stuff, I feel that way too, a lot. <laughs> uh, maybe some of the folks that are listening are also nerds in that respect. But you know, you had some some interesting times at, at the White House. And I wonder what some of your big memories are that really just pop out uh, about being in the White House. And this is the Trump White House, which we were both there at the same time. We saw each other a little bit. You know, I was chief economist of the Office of Management and Budget from 2019 to June 2019 to May of 2020. Uh, but I know that we talked otherwise when you got back to Heritage and stuff like that. But what were some of your key uh, memories from the White House? Well, first of all, if you're listening to this podcast, you're definitely a nerd. I'm right, sorry. Right. And I say and that, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> what of uh, us. There are so many stories I can tell about the White House, uh, some that would be embarrassing, some that would be disturbing <laughs> to the listeners, not surprising, but 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 all of the above. I think that one of the things that it's important to so I, I like to take, you know, as a, 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 a someone who, who likes who is very good and very comfortable, I guess, 
thinking about big, big thoughts, theoretical ideas, I like to take a step back and place all of these institutions in their proper context, right? And so the way that, and I'm going to use an analogy that may be a bad one. So set it, you know, you, you don't have to go with me here, but but the way I like to think about it, the the sort of economic policy making community in DC is that you have Congress who that's kind of like the ownership of the football team. Okay. So they're setting the 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 sort of overarching thematic vision, or at least that's what they should be doing, right? They set the over. Uh, arching budget, they sort of point the government in a in a direction. It might not be the right direction, but they point it in a direction, and and then it sort of kicks off to the administration to execute, right? And within the administration, you have the White House and all of the sort of sub agencies within the White House, like OMB and within OMB OIRA, and there, there are a bunch of other ones too. But, uh, and then you also have the agencies that are kind of outside of the, what is it, 17 acres that kind of make up the White House complex. And within the White House and the EOP in general, that's sort of like the offensive coordinator for the administration, right? So you can call plays based on the, positions that you've been given, you can try to move agencies in certain directions, but by and large, you're not the one executing, right? You're the one calling the plays. And then it's the people at the agencies who are actually, you know, executing based on the play calls or ignoring the play calls that are coming from for coming from the White House. And so for a White House to be successful, there really needs to be not just an appreciation of the role that those different entities have within the larger institution of government, but there has to be sort of a, an integration between the executive office of the president and the White House and what the and what the agencies are doing. And then ultimately that gets fed back, gets fed back to Congress. Within the context of the federal budget, uh, that's all orchestrated through the through through the federal budget process, right? And which gets kicked off with the president submitting their own budget plan for congressional consideration. And then it all getting, you know, worked out on the Hill, and then coming back to the administration for, uh, for, for, for execution. So that's like a theoretical answer to, you know, what sort of what was going on in the White House. I think that one of the, I mean, I was there at the very beginning, like I was there on day one and stayed for a little bit over a year. And, and during that time, there were, you know, well, there was one really big transition within the White House where we went from having one chief of staff who ran the White House more or less like the Wild West to another chief of staff who uh, didn't, <laughs> you know, for, uh, and, um, and I've, like I said, I've got lots of, I got lots of stories during the, during, during those two 10 years, but, but one of the things for better, or for worse that Trump did is he brought in a bunch of different kinds of experience to the white house and a bunch of different ideologies. And in my view, the only way that that can really work is if you have a a strong executive uh, that has empowered a strong chief of staff to kind of bring those you know some of those opposing views together into a coherent narrative, and that that's not that's not really what that's not really what happened. And I and I and and like I said, for for both better for for both good reasons and 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 for bad reasons. And there was both good and there was bad that came out of that. Um, but that really defined most of my experience in the White House. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff, Paul. And and I like the way you broke it down of what the the quarterback and you know the offensive coordinator <laughs> coming from the executive branch. I mean, it's I think that's that's true. I, I saw a lot of that as well. And being a chief economist of OMB, I was on Troika, the help to write the budget, go in and look at all the economic forecasting and with the treasuries, chief of staff and um CEAs, chief of staff. And um, um, and so it was it was an interesting time to kind of think about what's all going on. But you do see kind of all the back and forth, you know, whether it be uh, Peter Navarro coming in on on trade policy and protectionism versus, let's say, Larry Kudlow, uh, who would be more on the free market side of, of free trade. Um, and there were a lot of discussions that were going on um, that people don't see on the outside very much. But um, but it is important for there to be a direction and a vision there. 
So I'm glad that you were there kind of at the, the beginning. I was, I was more near the end. Uh, whenever COVID hit and the shutdowns happened, I was one of those who was like, well, I need to get back uh, to Texas where there's going to be some freedom and there was some family stuff going on. But, um, but it's, a, it's a remarkable time, like being in the White House, having that experience overall. Like you said, you definitely have ups and downs <laughs> that oh, yeah. go through it. Were there any particular policy issues? I know this is one of your areas I want to get into next that, that you really helped to, to drive and, and come to fruition at the end of the day while you were there. Yeah. Um, so a few, you know, myself and really the whole domestic policy staff was very much involved with the re repeal and replace debacle. <laughs> so we didn't really get anything out of it, but we learned a tremendous amount through that experience. And really a lot of the lessons that we learned out of that transitioned into this uh, TCJA, the tax reform conversations that that really took off at the in the later half of that year. Uh, and one of the big lessons that we learned was the role that a, a White House can have in influencing the legislative process, right? So one of the things that I did really early on during my tenure is I brought as I was the deputy director of the DPC, which which is the sort of main coordinating domestic policy body within the EOP. So we were overseeing essentially all domestic policy. And uh, one of the things that I did is I brought in folks who had worked in other White Houses to help us think through how best to do that. And one of the one of the people who I brought in was the great you know, Reagan attorney general and former uh, White House counselor, Ed Meese. And Ed sat down with my staff and essentially said, look, you know, your job is not to do the horse trading. That's what Congress specializes in. Your job is to figure out what can be done practically and put that out there and try to get folks to drive to drive to it. Honestly, we we didn't uh, I don't think we really used that lesson when we went through the repeal and replace fights. And 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 what I mean by that is what happened is that. Ryan puts out his bill to replace the the Affordable Care Act and there were a lot of arrows that were that were that were directed at that bill and Congress thought that we were in the process of negotiating with the house on the contents when in reality we were kind of helping them in some ways but we but but it was their bill right it was their legislative agenda that they were running with and so the you know folks who didn't like it both in the senate and the house were coming to us in the white house and kind of using us to run you know diplomatic measures with House leadership. And that's not really the job of the White House, right? And so there, and so, you know, we we learned, you know, through that process that we shouldn't be doing that, right? And 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 that there are really two approaches that are successful. The first approach is, is that you kick it off to Congress and you say, you guys do, you know, here's generally what we want. Here are sort of the the core pillars of a legislative agenda that that we would like to see. And we did that with tax reform. We issued a, a statement, I think, in May or June of 2017 that said, you know, a, you know, any tax reform proposal that Congress comes up with should have these four or five things. And then ultimately, you stand back and you put a wall up and you say, look, Congress, you 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 figure out the details. If you've got problems, you need to go talk to the Ways and Means Committee chairman. You need to go talk to leadership. Don't come to us. It's not that's not our job. Right. And then when you produce a bill, then we'll we'll consider it, right? And we can help with technical stuff. And I mean, sure, you were involved with that at OMB, but but the horse trading all needs to be done up on Capitol Hill, not at 1600 Pennsylvania. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just take ownership over the whole thing and say, you know, we've got this agenda. We're gonna we're gonna try to we're gonna we're gonna try to get this through the process, and you know, and that's that's what's up. And honestly, it was really interesting because I saw with the Biden administration and him trying to get the Build Back Better agenda done, I saw him making a lot of the same mistakes that we were making back with repeal and replace, where Biden was putting out this agenda. He was asking Congress to engage with it, while at the same time, he was at least putting out this perception that he was open to horse trading with folks like Manchin and, and, and Cinema. And ultimately, all of that did, I think, was, you know, mess up, mess up the process, right?
And so anyway, that was a big lesson that we learned. I think it really helped us get TCGA done. Um, and, uh, and ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm proud of us for having learned that lesson and, and being able to get that done. There were a yeah. number of executive orders that I wrote and that I think produced good things, um, at least good plans that set up, you know, stuff that might happen in the future. Um, so two that I wrote were, uh, one on opportunity and social mobility with a colleague of mine, uh, Jaron Smith. And then I also wrote another one that OMB ended up doing a tremendous amount of work on, uh, on the, uh, government reorganization, like asking big questions about is the government, is the federal government organized correctly? And if it's not, what changes might be, why, uh, might be made. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of that executive order, which I, which like, looking back at it was sort of a sort of wild was that we solicited feedback from the public and from, uh, folks who work for the federal government. And I think at the end of the day, we opened up the window for, I think, two months. And I think we got something like 120 or 130,000 individual ideas. And they were uh, all over the place, you know? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we got, we, you know, we would get ideas like, uh, you know, my name is Joe and I work for Agency X and James is is a really bad worker and you need to get rid of James. So we would get those. And then we would also get really thoughtful ideas on, you know, just, you know, how the federal workforce might be restructured, how agencies might be restructured, how we might just rethink, rethink the whole thing. At the end of the day, OMB did a lot of work on this and, you know, that, that work is still there and, and folks, Folks could choose to pick it up in the future. But as you know, whenever you are considering, you know, major reforms to the federal government, there, there's, there is also an entire class of people whose, you know, livelihoods, honestly, are based in the status quo. And they're very organi organized and um, and they will and they will be there to tell you about all the problems with your with your new ideas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's something, too. I mean, there's more talk of this now, kind of the weaponization of government um, yeah. and this, the spending problems that are going on. I wish that would have been more of a talk, you know, even back then. Uh, but I think the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was huge. Kind of this. There were some reforms that I think took place after that, too, that I know that Russ Vote um, had been working on at OMB. Um, kind of based on some of that work that you were doing. I remember the EO 13771, which I guess maybe been after you, uh, the regulations. Um, there was a lot of work on that in OIRA at OMB. And so there was a lot of key reforms that, of course, when the, one administration, it's one of the issues, though, with having one administration doing a lot of good, and the next administration comes in and just throws it all the way and kind of goes in a different direction where maybe we need Congress to act a little bit more in some of these areas. Um, but I think, I think we could talk about the White House stuff all day, but I really want to pick your brain now about some of the economic policy, kind of your, mm -hmm. your research and, and things you've learned over time. What are, what are kind of your constructs, your framework that you like to think about things in? Is it certain schools of economic thought? Is it institutional economics? And, and what, 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 what's, where do you start whenever you're thinking about economic policy? Well, I'm an economic historian. Yeah. And so I, <laughs> and so I approach, you know, all of these academic questions as an, as an economic historian. And ultimately, I have a healthy respect for institutionalists. Uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the work of Douglas North and Barry Weingass and John Wallace up at the University of Maryland, I've, I've found extremely influential to my own thought processes. And ultimately, I think that the empirical evidence that they put forward uh, and, and in particular, John Wallace's research on the impact of public corruption or the how populace's um, conceptions of public corruption has sparked reforms, both at the state level and the federal level. I found all of that extremely convincing. But, you know, how do I think about economic policy? Well, first of all, I, I don't think look, look, economic policy, as we think of it today, really didn't exist before the 1940s, right? So before, before the 1940s, uh, economic policy or public finance wasn't as, I mean, you know, you know, there were obviously Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and all those people were out there, you know, David Ricardo were out there, out there saying, you know, what the, what they were saying. And some of that was making its way into governance, but, you know, 
the reality is, is that they were just kind of winging it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, but at the same time, there was a healthy skepticism about things like the federal debt, right? And a major reason why there was skeptic, uh, skepticism about the federal debt was because folks saw the debt as a way that rich people got richer off the backs of poor people, right? And so in essence, here's like, you know, here's like, uh, here's the easiest way I can explain that something happens uh, internationally, uh, country has to go to war, country doesn't have money in its coffers to fund said war, country has to raise debt to fund war. The same people who get rich off of the bonds that are sold by the federal government to raise money for the war are the people who are producing things for the war effort, <laughs> right? And and if that's the cycle, then the popular opinion is, you know, going to be that when one comes out of, you know, when the country comes out of war to do something about the debt, right? And then all of that, that, that sort of general framework breaks down for lots of different reasons during the 1930s and, and 1940s. And and so really what we see, you know, coming out of the Keynesian re uh, revolution of the 30s and 40s, but that gets sort of grafted on to public finance is this concept of macroeconomic management. What can the government do to control the, the you know, these sort of ag aggregate, you know, functions of the of the economy? And the, the metrics that came out of that were essentially threefold, right? Um, if you're thinking about like, what is the government doing in terms of the larger economy, then what you want is you want, you want an economy that's growing because it's generally productive. You want an economy that uh, has fairly low in employment. Ob that shows up in this concept of maximum employment, which is sort of problematic in other ways. But like, anyway, we'll set that aside, right? And and then when it comes to monetary policy, you uh, want to keep inflation low, right? You want prices to be fairly stable. And so from the 50s through really the early 80s, those goals governed public finance. And by and large, they were bipartisan, right? So, you know, you had Democrats and you had Republicans uh, and everybody wanted the same three things. They wanted a productive economy that was growing. They wanted stable prices and they wanted low unemployment, right? And there was a lot of, there was a tremendous amount of disagreement. I'm not trying to, you know, tr minimize that in any way, but there was a tremendous amount of disagreement on how to get there, but there was general agreement on where you were ultimately going. The other interesting thing is that when, if you, if you think about those three goals, they're fairly objective. You know, and I'm again, I'm going to set aside all of these debates on whether or not, you know, we're, uh, you know, adequately measuring GDP or productivity, but assume that we are right. You can you can ask this empirical question of, you know, does said policy achieve some outcome? And what we've seen over the last 40 years is an absolute breakdown in those shared goals. Like if if you went to the average an average member of Congress today and you asked, you know, what should economic policy be doing? First of all, I bet most couldn't couldn't tell you. And and then the those that are more sophisticated, especially those on the extremes, are beginning to think about economic policy as a set of tools in this larger toolbox to achieve some social ends, right? So in other words, you have folks on the left say, you know, that economic policy should be used to, you know, solve for climate change or, you know, uh, to combat inequality. And then you have people on the right saying that economic policy only matters if it's producing good jobs, whatever that means. Right. Right. And, and so uh, I, I think that's a problem. I think that's a, I think that's a major problem because if we can't agree with where we're going, then we're surely not going to agree on how to, how to get there. And, and I, I, I also, you know, not to belabor this point, but I also don't think that the general public 
even thinks about economic policy in, in that way, right? In terms of solving for climate change or for you know creating creating good jobs, right? Really what matters for most people is, you know, what's what's going on at the dinner table, right? I, am I financially free? I, am I am I employed? Am I getting raises every year? You know, things things like things like that. How much am I paying at how much am I paying at the grocery store? And the more convoluted the policy becomes from those shared goals, the less clear those interactions are going to be. And I think that's going to just, I think, honestly, it's going to frustrate people. I think people are going to just, you know, throw up their hands and say, drain the swamp, <laughs> right? Y'all yeah. are, are all a bunch of bozos and, and, uh, and aren't speaking to, you know, real issues. Mm -hmm. And that's a, and that's a problem. It's a major, major problem. Yeah, no, it is. And um, I think that's a good history, too, of what's what's been going on, the, the different cycles that we've seen. There used to be a lot more uh, bipartisanship. I mean, look, JFK had um, one of the first tax cuts besides Coolidge in the 20s. You had the JFK tax cuts, right, um, yep. where there was some agreement there that was going on. And you had the Reagan tax cuts. Um, there's also been some bipartisanship, I guess, more recently about spending, <laughs> yeah. where, where both sides seem to be wanting to spend more. I'm hopeful that right now there's a change, at least within the Republican side, of, of not wanting to spend. Now, at least they're talking a good game. I think there was a pretty good debt deal that was passed here recently. The debt ceiling um, increased by the House Republicans, try to put in some restraints. But but I wonder, like, how do we really get to turn the tide towards you know, given your economic history, understanding and what everything else, there was a big tide in the, in the 80s, to your point, with Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, um, Hayek, Friedman. You, you know, you had a, a big revolution, kind of this free market revolution. And we saw the direction, kind of the great moderation that happened thereafter. Um, and, and now it just seems like we've had expanding government, especially since George W. Bush administration. I mean, there were some before that, too, especially then. And then you had Obama. Uh, there was more spending under under Trump. Right. I think the tax cuts were good. The deregulation was really important, uh, but also the dynamics of what was happening in Congress. Everybody wants to spend more at the end of the day. Um, how do we get back to some of that free market pro growth policies to really turn the tide so that, you know, the 31 plus trillion dollars in national debt, uh, doesn't just eat us alive with the interest on the debt growing over a trillion dollars and things of that nature every year. Um, what do you think are some of the next steps that we need to take? Well, if we can answer that question, we will solve all of the yes, <laughs> yes, we'll solve all the problems. <laughs> I, you know, I I think first of all, you're exactly right. Like when members come to Washington D.C., they don't come to do less; they come to do more. Right. Uh, so the, even even the very best, most fiscally conservative members of Congress want to spend money, right? My uh, one of the jokes that I have um, it's not really a joke, but one of the but one of the jokes that I that I like to tell is that you know everybody's a squish on something. Everybody's a squish on something, and you can find again you can find the most conservative member. There is I guarantee you there is one thing that they would they they would just spend to oblivion on. Right. It might, and it might be the post office. It might be Medicare. It might be some program that nobody has ever heard of and that's ultimately irrelevant. But but national defense is usually up there. National defense. Um, yeah. Like there, there's all, I mean, as, as you know, being at OMB, there <laughs> there's a lot. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and and so it's not hard to find something. And so that's the, that's their inclination. Right. And so the the thing that prevents them from from you know move from from falling off the cliff right from moving in that direction you know forever it, it are constraints right and you know Jim Buchanan uh, the Nobel Prize winner uh, and economist at, at George Mason University in Virginia and Virginia Tech yeah, one has, of my favorites by the way one of my favorites yeah he's he's um, He's when I was at GMU uh, a long time ago now, um, you know, he was still around, still teaching a seminar. I learned quite a bit and have some stories from that from that experience that I could tell on another episode. But um, but he he's he's written extensively on constitutional restraint. And uh, and I, I maybe that's where we need to go. Maybe we need to, to move in, in a constitutional restraint direction rules. I know you you've thought extensively about this, um, probably more than I have, uh, honestly, in part because I'm such a uh, 
you're you, being in Texas, you're you're exogenous to the system. Being in in uh, in DC, I'm I'm in I'm I'm part of the problem, right? I'm, yeah, I'm endogenous. Yeah. I'm here, and <laughs> um, and trying to change change from within. But but anyway, um, you know, uh, there there are a number of other things that have worked in the past, and there are other there are other things that are changing today that, that weren't around in recent history that are also important. So just for instance, um, you know, you did see an explosion in spending and in debt during the Bush administration. And at the same time, th there really wasn't much of a direct cost of that spending and debt, right? I mean, we didn't see inflation take off. That's not the case today, right? Inflation is, is, is an issue. Uh, it's affecting everybody. Um, it will continue to affect it, folks. Uh, I know you're talking to some folks pretty soon on monetary policy that are more sophisticated on this issue than I am. Um, but, you know, like it, it's very clear that the Fed doesn't have this under control. Uh, and, you know, like that that's a problem. Right. And I think that that's starting to make its way outside of Washington. Right. Where folks are starting to go, look, this is an issue. And the only thing that's really going to remove pressure off the Fed is for Congress to start scaling back spending, right? And we just saw the House, you know, last week pass a bill that I think reduces the deficit by like four and a half trillion dollars, which would be enormous if they could actually get this done. Biden will never sign it, right? And again, it's because they like like the, the, there is no longer a there's that that shared consensus is no longer there. He doesn't think that this is a problem. In fact, whenever Biden has talked about inflation, it's he's been pivoting off of himself, right? He's been pivoting off of, of what Congress has done and what the federal government has done, right? It's 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 all about, well, you know, this is for the Fed to to deal with. And then when he says, well, what, you know, what what's to blame for inflation? Well, it's these greedy corporations, right? It's it's other people, it's not me, it's somebody else. Somebody, somebody else is is, is at fault here. Um, that's a that's an issue. That's a that's a significant issue. And honestly, until people start holding their elected representatives accountable for saying those sorts of things, uh, I, I don't think that they'll learn. Because I, one of the things that I like to tell, I used to tell my my staff in, in the White House, and that I told my staff at Heritage, is that you know, if there are any members of Congress watching this, I apologize. But members of Congress, by and large, are not leaders; they're followers. And they're following you, right? They're following us. And if we aren't putting something out there to force them in a, in a, in a certain direction, they're not going to respond to it. Now, uh, in my work on the budget process, and this, this came up in my book that was published in 2019, uh, right before the pandemic started, which is, which is great. It's great for book sales. Let me yes. tell, tell you what, yeah. <laughs> uh, my publisher sent me a bunch of copies of the book, expecting, expecting that I would take them places and sell them. And then uh, that didn't happen. No. So, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, but one of the things that I talk about in the book is that one of the issues that has uh, predated most budget process reforms in our history, and this is going back all the way to the very beginning, is the public getting interested in this idea of public corruption, right? So, uh, and and this is when I come back, where I come back to John Wallace and the great work that he has done on state constitutional reforms. So, for instance, if you look at when st when uh, most states adopted their um, requirements to balance the budget, it was done during the 1830s and 1840s, right after uh, there was excitement regarding public corruption and involving states basically making bad investments in in, in the development of infrastructure and canals. Right? Um, they were raising debt. Um, to fund the building of canals, they were then turning it around and giving it to their buddies who weren't doing a very good job in building out that infrastructure. And so the people said, look, what am I getting for, for this debt, right? I'm not getting anything for it and you're enriching your friends. Uh, and so when the, the, uh, the uh, property requirements were dropped for, um, for the ability to vote during that same period, one of the first things that the the voters demanded balance balance budget requirements. Uh, 
if you fast forward to after the Civil War, there's this thing called the Anti-Deficiency Act, which says that, I mean, it was amended over a bunch of different times, but basically what it says, it's the government shutdown thing. And it says that if a uh, agent of the federal government spends money that's not appropriated, that they are, they're liable. They're, they're legally responsible for that. They can go to jail, they can pay fines. And um, those didn't come come into play until the early 1900s. Um, but that law was passed in part because of what the federal government was doing, probably for the right reasons during the Civil War, right? And then immediately after the Civil War. So what would happen is that the post office, this was like an annual thing, the post office would get appropriated money, they would then spend it all in the first month, and they would go to Congress and say, I'm all out of money, I need more money. And they would say, well, what are you spending money on? And they would say, it doesn't matter. Like you gave me the money and I, and I, and I spent it. Right. Yeah. And so Congress started to say, you can't do that anymore. Right. You, <laughs> you, you can only spend money that's been appropriated for specific purposes. And we're going to set a schedule throughout the year that OMB helps the agency set in today um, that uh, makes sure that you don't spend all the money in the, in the first month. That occurred immediately before, like that act was passed immediately before the post office and a couple of other agencies were found uh, to be involved with acts of public corruption. Um, the same thing with the 1921 act that gave us the executive budget process uh, and, and Bob or the Bureau on the Budget, which became the Office of Management and Budget and also the Government Accountability Office. Um, and folks, you know, forget this, but but what happened in the couple of months before the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 was enacted, right? The Nixon, the yep. Nixon went down, right? Right, right. So Nixon signed the Congressional Budget Act the same month that he resigned, right? Wow. So people were excited about public corruption, right? So I think that that's something that can motivate voters to demand changes. But that's, I mean, honestly, that's where it's, it, 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 it has to, like we can, you know, uh, Milton Friedman has this great line where he basically says, you know, the reason to keep ideas out there and continue talking about ideas is that at some point there is going to be a disaster, whether or not is it is a perceived, you know, not a real disaster, only a perceived disaster or an actual disaster. And if those are ideas are floating around, then it's more likely that they're going to end up in the package of solutions. Right. And so from Washington, we can talk about ideas. We can continue to move the ball. We can continue to advance, you know, stuff from the inside. But ultimately, there, there needs to be some level of accountability and push from the outside to get stuff done because yeah. they're not leaders, they're followers. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And it reminds me of Rahm Emanuel's, right? The uh, don't let a crisis go to waste. Yeah, but, but but we need that crisis to go in a good direction, though. I mean, his idea was we need to expand government and do all these other things. But maybe we need to have less government spending, um, start to eliminate some of these departments that shouldn't exist and really shrink the size and scope of government. Because at the end of the day, that will also help with the Fed's doing to manipulate the economy and create these boom and bust cycles. I mean, there's all these connections. I've had John Cochran on too, kind of the yeah. fiscal theory of the price level. I mean, there's all these connections that go in of government failures. There's all this talk about market failures and everything else and capitalism is done with. And um, uh, we're, we're talking about this on May 4th, 2023. There's an anti-monopoly summit that's going on right now uh, with Lena Khan and a whole bunch of others talking about that capitalism is dead and that it's just big greedy corporations that are running the show now when in fact it's really their big greedy politicians and bureaucrats out of DC that are sending all these policies down from on high and reducing competition in the marketplace because they don't like it. It goes back to your point earlier about social justice and other things that are happening that can't happen. Well, they can from the top down, but it creates all these other distortions and makes us worse off in the process instead of it maybe coming from the bottom up, but that doesn't happen as quickly for them or for Keynes or for others. And so um, I really appreciated this discussion about economic policy and economic history. Paul, I think we could talk all day, uh, but let's, let's, have, let's do this in another episode sometime soon. Uh, any final words though, before, before we go? Well, I, I really enjoy it. I could, I, you know, I'm a, I, I worked in the Senate for, for about five years. And so I could filibuster all day long about any of these topics. Um, and yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to do so uh, today with you. You know, I think, you know, if, 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 if I come back 
to, you know, what, you know, sort of this motivating factor, you know, and, 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 and one of the things that has defined my career, and I think, you know, d- d- helped define yours too, is that, uh, you know, in Washington, DC, there's a lot of conformity, a tremendous am- uh, amount of conformity. And the reality is, is that we need less of it, right? A line I like to use is from uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. If you've never, by uh, any dealer, if you've never read a book, it's a great book. Um, and she has this line in there where she says, the creator, love, uh, the creator loves pizzazz. You know, we need more ideas. We need more pizzazz. We even, you know, we even need more pizzazz in Washington, D.C. And ultimately, we need to trust people. Like, that's what it all comes back to. I think, you know, the title of your podcast, Let People Prosper. That, I mean, that just hits the nail on the head. We need to let people prosper. We need to trust them. And ultimately, we need to think about economic policy in a way that actually gets out of the way, that allows people to prosper, right? And allows the the pizzazz to come out. And so, yeah, I like I said, I, I appreciate I appreciate this opportunity and uh let's let's do it again soon. Yeah, that sounds good, Paul. And uh, I like that. The pizzazz. Uh you got a lot of the pizzazz, so keep it going. Uh, I look forward to your new ventures that's coming out. Um, God bless you and your you and your family. And um, I look forward to having you on again soon. Thank you. I appreciate uh, it. And for the audience, if you like this, uh, please leave us a five-star rating. Share it with your family and friends and social media and other places. Uh, I really appreciate all of you who are listening in and these discussions, these nerdy discussions that we get to have. Um, it's a part of learning more about our world so that at the end of the day, we can let people prosper. So until next time, Let people prosper and have a prosperous day. Thank you.